Are you ready? The Cornelia Stephanie Show. Wake up to love your call to action. Join Cornelia as she empowers others to live heaven on earth. Cornelia teaches listeners how to be the authority over yourself, embracing your inner guru. Feel yourself uplifted into limitless expansion, integrating ease and grace in a changing world. This show will cover topics such as unconditional love, your physical body, how to be in extraordinary relationships, create financial and emotional wealth, embracing entrepreneurship in the new earth. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cornelia Stephanie Show. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you today. We have uh, our stories of hope. And I have our first guest with us today, Stephanie Dunn. She's a passionate advocate for empowering women to embrace leadership in the complex journey of working motherhood. With her unique hopper to hunter framework and her claim to fame as the woman who gets life advice from t-shirts, she guides women from the passive state of hopefulness into the intentional proactive mindset of the hunter. Her work inspires women to bridge the gap between professional success and authentic, intentional motherhood. This dual approach redefines what it means to lead in both personal and professional spaces, allowing women to thrive as they navigate their roles with purpose and resilience. Welcome to the show today, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful that you're here because... We were talking in the green room before we we came live, uh, just what there seems to be a a real disconnect or a real struggle out there for women and also couples uh, on how to make time for themselves, how to make time for the relationship and how to navigate life when everything is changing so fast. And then you've got careers going on. And, you know, how do how do you do it? And you said something to me very important, but we'll we'll just let you pick it up from here. How how do how do women navigate this journey? Yeah, so I think the one big thing to note um, is that there is no one size fits all answer. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I one of the biggest problems, I would say that makes women start to operate from a place of burnout and overwhelm um, is that they are in constant comparison of how they measure up to other families. Um, You know, you have the mom who has four kids and she's also in charge of the PTO and she's, you know, coaching sports and she just seems to manage a lot of things. What you don't see in the background is, you know, a lot of that she's maybe managing with some anger and some resentment and, Mm -hmm. Um, unmet needs herself, but she doesn't show that. Um, But then, you know, makes other women feel, you know, inferior to her. Um, And not necessarily, you know, that's not maybe her intention. Um, But we as women in general, I think, don't necessarily set a standard for our family. And if we are married, you know, obviously, that's a, a conversation that you have to have with your significant other. Um, But I think at the basis of it, each woman and each family needs to have their own set of values and what they want their family to look like. And in the world of social media and just constant comparison, like we have to really stay grounded in what it is that we want for our family and our kids. That's so big. That's so big. I think, you know, like... um, as a coach myself, one of the things that we always uh, say that when people have doubt in being able to achieve their goals and their dreams and their visions, when they use doubt, that's a, a dream killer, doubt as a dream killer, yeah. doubt in their ability. And what you're saying is that um, comparing comparing yourself to another family, comparing yourself to others in the world on social media or whatever is a killer. It's yeah. it's it's not, it's not a helpful thing to do for the family. Yeah, correct. And that self-doubt and self-comparison, I think can go hand in hand somewhere. You start to compare, what does my life look like in comparison to theirs? What do I want my life to look like? 
Is it closer to what they have or what I think that they have? And then all of a sudden you get into that self-doubt factor where all of a sudden you're thinking like, I, I can't even do this. I don't even know how to lead my family. I'm obviously failing. Something's not right because we're not thriving like we should be. Um, and, and really it's because that there is just no foundation for what you see as success for your family. And do you feel that that's the missing part is that um, being able to invite the woman to have her her vision, her values, what what she sees, how she wants the family to be, not according to everyone else. So basically, you know, her authority is missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. I mean, I think that that's a big component of it. Um, that women need to be leading their family. And because of all the outside noise, it's hard to figure out how. Um, a little bit of it we are told, you know, is that we are just going to have those natural instincts come in. When our kids are born, you just know what to do. And you do, but you very quickly forget that. Um you know, and it's just one small instance, maybe when you you bring your kids home and people are constantly asking you, are you breastfeeding or bottle feeding? What do you mean you're not breastfeeding? Well, it's really not that hard. You know, you should be able to be successful at it. I breastfed for three years. You know, from the minute that your baby comes home from the hospital um, or the minute that they're born, because women compare birth stories as if one person's birth story is more significant than another. Or if you, your child was born a certain way, it makes you less of a mom. Um, so the societal pressures that we're under from the second that we become mothers, it, they push you into a sense of comparison, making you feel less than, making you feel worthless, that you, you suddenly don't have the tools to lead your family like you thought you were supposed to, you know, instinctually inherit. Yeah. So then, then now you're uh, running around and you're not able to check all the boxes and you feel that you can't keep up and you feel that you're fail, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not thriving in the right. unit. Right. And then, then there is also your communication with your significant other that, that mm -hmm. also needs to be both of you on, on the same page. You said it earlier. I think this is a big piece. And that is what, what are the values of the family and are both, uh, both the woman and the man on the same page about the values for the family? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And there, you know, women just in general are just a powerhouse anymore. Women know how to lead their family. And it, it was said to me in one way that just made a lot of sense where people say, you know, but the, the man needs to lead the household, mm -hmm. um, which I wholeheartedly agree with. I don't ever want people to think that I'm like pro woman, anti man. Um, they have their place and we have ours, but it's like, you know, when it comes to leading your family, the, the husband might be the captain of the ship, um, but the wife is the compass and she needs to be the one there leading the family, you know, with those intuitive leader skill, leadership skills that we have. Um, but there's so much that overshadows that. And again, I don't know, like we've kind of gone back to uh, there's just so much comparison and constant putting women in a place of of kind of shame and guilt. And you think. You know, you have your own things that you grew up with that are instilled in you that subconsciously you help um, or let navigate your family. You know, and I stress that a lot of times to people like I don't I don't even let people pick the music in my car when they ride with me. <laughs> like We're we're listening to what I want to listen to, but I let them dictate how I'm raising my family, how we are living our life. That's crazy to me, but it's the norm. There are so many women living that exact same way because they just want something that makes them feel like what they're doing is enough. Yeah. And that part about, um, you know, trusting themselves 
uh, listening to what it is that they feel they need in the family to know what that is. That's why you're helping women. That's yeah. why you're doing this work so that you can um, take the focus back from out there and putting the the pointer back at the woman to discover what it is that, that she really uh, wants and needs and how does she see it. And so the the pointer is back at her because she's the one that is in charge of that. That's her. That's her. That's her yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, do you do you have like uh, a couple of tips that for women that are listening right now of something that they can do right now to begin? Yeah. So I think. Um, I mean, I have you know, as far as women that I, um, speak to or women that I coach, um, really what we focus on is the fact that you need to get back to your own authentic fulfillment. And the goal is for you to find authentic fulfillment within yourself. Remember who you are, your strengths, your experiences, and use those to create an impact on your family that is going to create basically generational wealth. Um, you know, life, life and your experiences, um, basically your legacy as a parent continues on for generations. So what you want your children's lives to look like, you know, you need to model that you need to set them up for that success um, early on. So, and I think a lot of women do want that. Um, the one big thing that I would say would be one of the first steps is to get on the same page with your spouse. Um, if, if there is one in the picture, and I know that everyone is, you know, everyone's situation is different. So there are a lot of single working moms. Um, if you are the only one within your household, you just need to make sure that you know what it is that you want to be passing on to your children. Um, if you have people that are in your life that are in constant connection with your kids, um, if you are a single mom or if you're not, they need to be aware of what your family values are, um, how you want to raise your kids, what you want to influence them, um, you know, and those sorts of things. So I think establishing those values within your family and what's important to you is one of those first steps. Um, and then one of the next ones is really like, you know, it all starts with you. And I, so many women that I speak to have to heal themselves before they can put a lot of these things into action. You, you I, and I know that that's one of the things that you do. You support women in that way. We just have a short time left. I want to be able mm -hmm. to make sure that we let the audience know how they can find you on social media. And you also yeah. had uh, something that you wanted to share. So maybe you can let us know your website and your social media handles and then whatever you wanted to share with the audience today. Yeah. So um, any anyone that's wanting information or just to follow me um, can always find me just on Facebook under my name, Stephanie Dunn, and it is D-U-N-N-E. Um, and then the same thing on LinkedIn. I post a lot of information on LinkedIn and there's an easy way um, to get a hold of me on there. Um, again, it's just under Stephanie Dunn. And then I do also have just an email list that I use to keep up with people and kind of provide um just some different tools, information. I'll share just some like tidbits of things that we might be working on that would be helpful um, to other families. And people can just text the um, the number 10, so one zero and then letter X and text that to 33777. And they can do that just to go ahead and join in the email list that way. Well, I think it's wonderful the work that you're doing. I'm so glad you came on the show today. I, I think it's important you spoke of it, the legacy, our children and our children's children. Um, yeah. You know, they are the future leaders and it's important. Stephanie Dunn, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, We're going you. to take a break on the Cornelia Stephanie Show. We'll be right back, everyone.
Welcome back to the Cornelia Stephanie Show, everyone. I'm so excited to introduce you to Kim McElroy. She's been drawn to horses since childhood. And as soon as she could hold a crayon, this manifested as her art. For more than 30 years, she has been known for her intuitive understanding of the sentient nature of horses and her ability to infuse her art with their spiritual energy. She distills this energy into expressions of horses, quintessential beingness in ways that transcend how they are traditionally defined. Through her incredible mastery of pastels and her talent in writing about her artistic insights, she conveys the power and beauty of the horse's form. Yet more than that, she offers a timeless glimpse of its soul. In the year of 2000, Kim and her husband Rod created Sky Land Sea Sanctuary in Washington State, where they provided loving forever homes to rescued horses and a menagerie of other animals. Now that their beloved horses have co-joined the council, their sanctuary is home to a resident herd of wild but well-fed deer and to ca capricious house cats. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Kim. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. So good. My goodness. So your love for horses has been a long love affair. It has lifelong, probably before I was born. <laughs> yeah, you probably brought that in from another life, right? Exactly. Yes, many, I'm sure. So, uh, and now you've also recently created an Oracle card deck. You are yes. the creator of this beautiful deck that you sent me. Yes, uh, co-creator, uh-huh. Co-creator, right? Yeah. And gorgeous, these gorgeous, gorgeous cards. Thank you. So, there we go. Yeah, and beautiful, beautiful images of horses. Yeah. And it's got a, what is it, a 40-page book? Yes, 40 yeah. or 40 cards and like a, I think it's 190 or something. Yeah, pages and um, 40 cards for the Oracle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and what, what made you want to create that? Uh, this has been a lifelong dream, really, um, because I began learning when I started showing my artwork directly to the public. Uh, I always wanted to be an artist. That was just that was also my lifelong love. Uh, like they went hand in hand, but I didn't have horses. I didn't. Um, I just always dreamt of them as a child. And then my encounters with them were, were transformative, um, but it didn't, didn't have the horsey lifestyle. So uh, I just held them in my heart. And then um, that coincided with my career uh, unfolding as an artist that horses came back into my consciousness through an encounter I had with some horses that just made me aware that there was more more to them that was really where my heart and soul understood who they were and I wanted to to start creating that and when I started painting horses then my art career opened up so um, I've from a very early time when I started doing my my paintings I discovered that people would react to my art like there was a message for them or some kind of uh, intuitive you know, it wasn't about whether they were a horse person or whether they rode horses, just something about the work would just evoke their emotions. And I wasn't a therapist, but I could tell that there was something more going on. And as I began learning uh, throughout my life about, um, you know, the psyche and how we work through our emotions and life experiences, I began finding that horses were a catalyst for that. So, um, and my art was like the surrogate almost of the horse uh, encounter, giving someone an encounter of being with the horse. They'd stand in front of the art and it was like they were standing with a, a real horse. And that experience has just been really uh, the, what started my whole journey with horses and healing in my art. Wow, that's that's so beautiful. I love how that just naturally all unfolded. And you're expressing your art, you're in tune with the horses. And now you're sharing all of those beautiful gifts with people that really want to take it on a, on a deeper level. It's like a spiritual journey with the Oracle car cards. And um, there's do you, what do you see the horse? Uh, what is the horse on a spiritual level? Uh, what is the meaning of the horse? Yeah, the horse, excuse me, the horse uh, to me is 
uh, they're, they're a powerful species that has co-created with us um, long before we came, you know, we're, we're emerging onto the planet. And they, they seem to be, you know, holding our best and truest selves. They help us access our authenticity and to not get into just the, you know, the illusion of being on the planet and all the, um, all the ego centered, um, ways in which we get caught in relationship or, or lifestyle or, you know, our dynamics with our culture. And, and they help us tap into our true selves as a soul and then bring that forth in our lives rather than just, you know, getting, getting distracted by, by being a human. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love the way that you put that. I, I've all often felt that the um when whenever the horse presents is that it has to do with our personal power, mm -hmm. right? That that that's the the mirror that the horse is showing us that we have personal power. And if we don't feel that we have personal power in that in that moment at that time, is to work with the horse energy to reclaim that personal power. Yeah, and a lot of people uh, relate the horse if they're not, uh, whether or not they have experiences with horses, um, or have have a, you know, a, a relationship with the horse. There's this interesting push pull with horses where most people think of them as you know dynamic and free, and and they are all those things, but they're also very introspective and intuitive, and like you said, they are a mirror, and. Um, And people take it personally when they're with horses, like, well, he didn't, you know, look directly at me or he didn't come over to me or touch me. And and there's a whole different relationship with the horse that goes on energetically that most people are not aware of, you know, how we are in our in our physical and emotional and spiritual body ripples out and affects them. And they decide whether or not they're willing to engage with that and their reflective you know, body language and how they interact with that is, is all like a biofeedback ripple effect. And they show us, you know, a reflection of what we're going through, especially in any kind of a therapeutic session when you're actually engaging with the horse in that setting. But every horse has that ability because they are such a social creature. They have such harmony in their herd and, and, and ideally, you know, in a natural herd, especially a wild horse, heard but even in domestic surroundings so it's it's really interesting when you get to thinking about horses as mirrors that's a perfect perfect term awesome I didn't even think about that that just came out yeah <laughs> you know I wasn't even thinking it just you're came tapping out. into the consciousness yeah absolutely absolutely I love that what do you want to share with the audience today to Uh, start working with horses, or if they already are working with horses, do you offer uh, personal session work? What is it that you're doing now on your sanctuary as well? Well, I don't, I'm not uh, an equine assisted um, teacher, but I I am sort of through my art. So the, the card deck is really the best way for people to connect um, at that level with, with my engagement. But I also do commissioned work that is... Um, not only portraits of horses for their people, which is I call soul lessons portraits, because it's not just, oh, you know, my beautiful horse has, you know, been in my life or whatever. It's it's that too, but it's really more about uh, when it's a one-on-one -on -one experience of someone who has a horse, it's, it's tapping into what this horse's soul message is for their person and what the person's soul message is with the horse and, and doing a work of art that, that, brings all of that conversation into something visual and, and emotional. Um, and for people who aren't into horses, I, I actually love to do like a soul essence work of art. That's like their horse spirit guide or their, their horse self, because to me, there's also like a part of us that's part horse. And, uh, and so who is that? And, and getting curious about that. That's beautiful. Let's let's tell the audience where they can find you on social media. Let's also tell the audience where they can find your Oracle card deck. Great. Okay. So my, my website is spiritofhorse.com and my Facebook is uh, Kim McElroy's Spirit of Horse Gallery. 
Instagram is Spirit of Force. And uh, the Oracle deck is wor available worldwide. It's published by Baron Company, and it's available through Amazon and other other places all over the country and the world. Uh, it's called The Council of Horses Oracle. Yeah, that's so beautiful. I know that in a few weeks, you and I are going to be meeting again for another longer podcast, where I'm looking forward to tell you about a dream that I had a few months back um, with horses. Wow. And that's we, awesome. Yeah, that's I'm looking forward and I'm looking forward to learning more about you and um, talking more about horses and how horses can help us heal. Absolutely. And so, you know, uh, and right now, I know that we all could use some healing for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. We're going to take a break on the Cornelia Stephanie Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Our next guest today is Guy Dazen, and he, uh, he has been here before. He's an academic, a playwright, a writer, a poet, a painter, an educator, and a podcaster. He holds two degrees in English literature and art history. He also has a deep affinity to esotericism and mysticism from Kabbalah to Taoism, Freemasonry, and Gnosticism. Wow, what words. We can discuss some of these core practices today and concepts that all esoteric denominations share. Welcome back to the Cornelia Stephanie Show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me back here, Cornelia. It's a great pleasure. Very excited to be speaking with you. So in the green room before we came on, you were talking about how right now things are unfolding in a very um, you know, uh, what was the word that you erratic. dramatic, um, uh, erratic maybe, but I used a different word, but I can't remember it. I, I said something along the, the lines of uh, a great uh, paradigm shift that is, uh, you know, uh, that occurs uh, right now unfolds. Yeah. So the paradigm shift. So, um, um, the paradigm shift that's unfolding. What is the shift on? What is the the shift unfolding to? From what? I think that humanity faces a lot of different dangers from a lot of different sources. Um, we have the you know the conflict, the uh, world uh, devouring uh, conflict that doesn't seem to be stopping or slowing down anyone soon, unfortunately. On the other hand, we have the human aspect where we no longer rely on actual human needs for our resource of knowledge, you know, where, where we get our information. We no longer rely on the services of humans or transportation, for example, with the automations. And uh, of course, there's another another kind of a threat looming like a Damocles sword over our heads as human beings and Homo sapiens for the last fifty thousand years as a civilization, which is the AI, you know, the uh, the resurgence or the introduction uh, or you know. Advance, as an advancement of a super intelligent, you know, cert centralized uh, AI computing, you know, being or or computer. So, um, where do you want to see us going? Where does your point of view, where does your consciousness or information that you're sharing with us, where do you want? Us to this is a this is a pivotal point I think in you know um, in in history and uh, not just the human history and not the not just the natural history of birth or the universe it's a uh, collective you know uh, if if we, humans cease to exist. Um, would history and reality even matter if there won't be anyone to be able to 
record, you know, to give count of everything that happens in that universe. This is a vacuous uh, kind of existence that we need to avoid because we're not sure of our place as humans in uh, societies, countries, and states that we have artificially divided ourselves throughout human history. And um, the universe doesn't seem to be very, um, you know, uh, affirming or positive towards uh, human beings. It, it seems to be very nonchalant and uh, very uh, doesn't care about the human beings as a life form on a distant planet in some remote, and now we know that Earth and the solar system, the Milky Way galaxy is one of the most remote areas in the universe. So um, we don't know if there will be some kind of uh, replacements to human beings and uh, meaning, the meaning itself of uh, existence will, you know, will be wiped out and then no one will uh, know. There will be no kind of uh, intervening uh, force that will, maybe, maybe there's some kind of a higher intelligence a progenitor to the universe that has created uh, many worlds in order to destroy them and create them and you know, fashion them in his own image or her. Um, we don't know that. Uh, so it is a very certain, uh, uncertain time, you know, a very uh, unstable and uh, turmoil written epoch of history and human history specifically. What do you want? What do you want humanity to do? What do you want humans to do to avoid that? You've laid it out of what could happen. Um, now, there are a lot. There are a lot of people who have a lot of suggestions, and none of them I fancy, you know, uh, personally. Um, the problem is there is no one kind of a figure or body or institution or country that can take the reins of power and actually lead uh, humanity out of the cesspool and uh, the chasm of uh, despair war, famine, uh, now we know it's also pesticide, um, not pesticide, also, um, you know, disease. Um, so what what you, I would like to see, yeah, yeah, yeah what, what would I would you, like to see, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, what I would like to see is one type of a unified institution that has a codified constitution that includes in its credo, you know, it's uh, alma mata, that all human beings are truly created equal, that all human beings have the same legal rights, states' rights, personal freedoms as the rest of humanity. And uh, people will not change, you know, in terms of ethnicity and culture, uh, in terms of their financial institutions and their respective economies. Um, that will take, you know, technology is advancing in, uh, you know, in a lateral type of way. It's not, it's not a entirely equal when it comes to technological advancements and uh, innovation. So we need to we need to pull out humanity from its own uh, destructive you know uh, uh, intentions because uh, as Freud mentioned the great uh, Freud um, Sigmund Freud mentioned that humans are driven by two things you know, uh, death and passion. And death is uh, equivalent, he used the word, uh, he borrowed them from the Greek uh, culture, ancient Greece and Athens. Thanatos, Thanatos is death, 
and eros is passion, which can mean can mean uh, erotic passion, but uh, but it can also mean love, you know, intimate uh, kind of uh, love, and um, mu mutual respect uh, between uh, humans, you know, um, harmony, um, all that good stuff. So. It is a very thin balance, you know, the, the balance of the world is hanging on it thin uh, right now. And uh, the uh, 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 destabilization of the world right now is occurring in an ever so rapid pace, and it doesn't seem to slow down. And uh, we are not forming uh, new uh, social circles. We are not, you know, forming new regulations. We are not imposing new kind of, uh, you know, tariffs uh, on uh, foreign despot and oligarchical kind of autocracies uh, as it was in the past. Uh, for example, with the USSR, um, you know, the former Soviet Union, we are not uh, implementing those steps in order to make sure that the balance of powers, you know, remains stabilized. And, let's uh, let's give the audience let's give the audience uh, two two things, two to three things that people can do to elevate their personal reality of what they can do. First of all, <laughs> first of all, try to drop all the screens, you know, you know, the tablets and. Uh, the mega super HD uh, TV screens, um, all of the, the computers and phones and smartphones. Because now nowadays you're, you're encountering more screens than human faces. So you need to establish relationships, real relationships with actual human beings, you know, that exist in your milieu. Now you is a French word for your neighborhood or your vicinity. So for people who don't know, so, um, let's also tell the audience to, how they can how they can look you up on social media and how they yeah, can. So, listen. Where's your podcast? Yeah, so you can look me up on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I have a profile, professional profile, uh, also on Facebook and. My podcast is on YouTube called Focus Grad Podcast. T H O T H Describe. T H E S C R I B Podcast on YouTube, where I talked with intellectuals and artists and authors about uh, a myriad of different topics and subjects. Well, Guy, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. I appreciate you coming back and giving us your perspective of, uh, you know, what we need to do in order to uh, ensure that we take better care of it this. It is crucial. Yeah. It is crucial. We take better at this care point, of ourselves you know. and this planet. I want to thank you so much for coming on. We're going to take a break on the Cornelia Stephanie show. We'll be right back, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Our next guest today is Catherine Knight. She's the creator of Parents Dementia Journey. Parents Dementia Journey offers courses and coaching, teaching care heroes the tools and techniques so their lives and move from feeling frustrated, anxiety, anxiety-ridden, angry, and totally overwhelmed to being calm and in control of their lives. Catherine's mother was diagnosed with dementia and overcoming many intense challenges caring for her mom, taking classes and talking with hundreds of caregivers of loved ones with dementia, she decided to help others on this difficult journey. Catherine is the, uh, Catherine is the author of Parents Dementia Journey, The Caregiver's Guide from Chaos to Calm, who, which has sold in six countries. Welcome to the show today. Well, thank you so much. Yes, I'm so glad that you're here because like we were saying, is there's so many people out there that are dealing with 
aging parents or caretaking for their parents or dealing with parents that have dementia um, or knowing someone that has dementia. Exactly. You know, it, it unfortunately is growing globally. And I have clients from all over the world, I, you know, that I work with because it doesn't matter whether you're in in Australia or the United States, if South Africa or Zimbabwe, I mean, it doesn't matter everywhere it's happening to so many people and my heart goes out to them. And that's why I started saying, how can we create your life so that you're a care hero instead of being quote, just a caregiver, because, you know, I highly respect every single person that there's taking care of a spouse, a sibling, a parent, anybody that's taking care of loved ones with dementia, they deserve that pat on the back because they're taking, and then if they, we have free workshops we do once a month and those people come in and they spend their time learning how to deal with it better so that they can handle it on a better, better path. You know, one of our, I'll give you an example. One of what Kara, who was, who started working with me um, four months ago, you know, we have what's called the code red call. And if you have a bad situation, you got to deal with somebody right now. You can't wait till next week's call that you can call us and we'll guide you through it. And, and Kara called me and said, Catherine, I can't take it anymore. My dad wants to go on a date. He's 93 years old. He wants to go on a date and I can't even get him to take a shower. And I said, Kara, I have the answer for you. It's real simple. She says, what do you mean? What do you mean? She's crying. And I said, okay, Tell your dad, yes, you'll take him to that bar. You'll let him meet women and he can go on a date. But first, he has to have that shower. He has to get his hairs cut. He got to get the dirt under his nails. Do all those pieces and see what happens. Are you sure, Catherine? I said, Kara, I'm so sure. Go for it. She calls me the next day. She said, Catherine, you're the goddess of dementia. <laughs> I said, why do you say that? She said, because I got dad all cleaned up. He looks so good. The best he's looked in two years since I've been taking care of him. Oh my gosh. And, and as soon as I said, okay, dad, you're ready to go. He said, I'm tired. I need to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we keep some, some sense of humor in through in taking care of a loved ones with dementia, because as, as like with, with my husband, we have his mother at our house too. And so one time I said to him, you know, well, gee, you're an only child. We'll have to take care of your mom when she gets older. He goes, honey, you're one of three and we're taking care of your mom. So it doesn't matter whether you're one of three or a single child. Somehow we got it all in our household. And I said, yep, that's true. So we keep a good sense of humor with it. You know, he helps a lot. We, you know, it takes a, a village to raise someone with dementia. It absolutely takes a village. One person cannot do it alone. And that's one of the things we, that we stress with our care heroes is they get a support group going, whether it's with a, like an Alzheimer's association, a local community, you know, because after a while they wear out their friends when they're talking about the, the difficulties they have taking care of the loved ones with dementia. You need someone who understands it. And that's where our weekly Zoom calls are very helpful because you're with people who are going through it right now, who has some, you know, everybody has the same issues, but different issues. That's how we put it. You have the same issues or different issues. And, you know, they're all doable. They're all solvable. But sometimes when you're mired in this thing, feeling all alone, that nobody is out there for you, that you are the only person to take care of loved one with dementia, we teach them that they're not alone. They're not alone anymore. They've got support. They've got Everybody needs support and they need someone to hold their hand sometimes. And that's what we do. And it's not just only us. We teach each other how to help each other. You know, because when you're talking about dementia, Tim, who came into our program, he said the best thing about our whole program was he was no longer alone. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, you know, he was taking care of his mom with his brother and his father, but he still felt alone. And that's what we can create a world that makes it better for each care hero that we, we work with. And there's a lot of resources out there. When I first started taking care of my mom seven years ago, there weren't a lot of resources. And that's why I created the book and, and the course and everything else, because we needed so much more. But now we have Alzheimer's Association. In America, we have AERP, which has different programs. There's no matter where you are, whether it's in the UK, UK has a lot of good social social programs out there for you. There's a lot of help out there that can help each care hero move forward in their path because we don't know, there's no date stamped on the bottom of the foot of our loved one to know what's going to happen, how long they're going to live. They say statistically, the average person with dementia lasts 10 years. Mm. You know, but some of my 
my wonderful people that come into my program, they, they don't last, their loved ones don't go 10 years. But one of the pieces we teach them is how to grieve for the loved one that they've lost because it's a different person. You know, I'm very close to my mom now, but I call her sweetie or honey. And that helps me to be even kinder to her because, you know, I might get frustrated if I'm thinking of her as my mom and I have to be the mother in the relationship. But yep. each one of those pieces are so important to understand. Does, does your mother know who you are? No, she doesn't know who I am. You know, one of the tips I give a lot of hospice people, because she's on hospice now, is when you talk to someone with dementia, ask them this one question each morning. How old are you? Because if they reply, oh, I'm 17, they're probably going to try to jump out of bed and fall. <laughs> if they say, I'm, I'm 800, they feel old, they're going to stay in bed that day. And that's an easy monitor of how they're doing that day. You know, my mom doesn't get out of bed any longer. We have to change her diapers. We have to slowly give her uh, liquids, trying to get her hydrated each day. There's a lot of different pieces. One of the things we're doing, we do once a month is um, levels of dementia, because there are seven levels of dementia. And within those different levels, there's different ways of communicating. There's different ways of taking care of them and how much help they need. Wow. I think, I think you're a saint. I, I really, I just feel your energy. It's so loving. It's so um, joyous, even in this heavy energy that you mm -hmm. have to face at, you know, with all of this. And it's, I, I just, I just feel your caring uh, nature. And I'm so glad that you're out there mm -hmm. doing this work because you have learned a lot of things mm -hmm. through this journey with with your mother and then with all the countless people that you've helped you know the the trick one of the tricks because i'm sure you've got many but one of the tricks that you shared early on and that is um when a person you know like where you said that the dad wanted to go on a date and and you said yeah let's 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 tell him we're gonna go on a date but we have to take a shower first and because that's all part of the the trick that we have to do mm -hmm. is right. That's part of it's a strategy that we can use to support mm -hmm. the person and yeah. not feel limited, right? In that way, correct. correct. And you know, in the with ladies, we can say, okay, um, you want to go to do a spa day. You know, there's a lot of different things we can do. Hygiene seems to be the biggest struggle that most of our care heroes have is the hygiene piece. You know, because our loved ones will say, oh, I had one today. Oh, I had one yesterday. Oh, I don't need one. I'm really clean. You know, all these different pieces. And you, as someone without dementia, you look at it. And as my husband says, if you try to figure out how to how their mind works, you're going to go insane yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you I want, figure yeah. I, I want to let the audience know how they can look you up mm -hmm. on social media and learn more about your courses and your work and where they can find you. Yeah, they can find me online. I have a website called, guess what? Parents Dementia Journey. The book is on Amazon, Parents Dementia Journey. And then if they want to email me, they can go to info, I-N-F-O, at Parents Dementia Journey. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Absolutely. If you are a care hero taking care of a loved one with dementia and you're struggling with anything, we are willing to help you any way we can and let you know when we have some free workshops out there too. You know, we do have a six month program that we're very proud of that has a self-paced um, program that they can do at their own pace. And, and that's what we're proud of is that we know that care heroes can't do something at Tuesday, every Tuesday at eight o'clock. It needs to be flexible. It needs to be so that they can work it when they want. If they're up at three o'clock in the morning, if they want to watch something, they can. And that's really helpful. I, I, I learned a lot of that myself. You know, I cannot plan much of anything unless I make sure that I have everything covered. You know, I take care of myself. One of the bi biggest things I did recently was fly out to Philadelphia and pick up a puppy. That was for me. And I got Callie Girl, who is a beautiful yellow lab, who is just bringing joy into the household. And, you know, I do things like that. And I encourage my care heroes to make a list of things that make them happy. Little things, five minutes might be a Kindle. 10 minutes might be a walk around the block. 
you know, things that they can do to make them happy. They feel more comfortable in their role that they're taking care of their loved ones. Because in most cases, they don't have to sit there at their side every minute of the day. There's ups and downs throughout the day. There's 10 minutes here, an hour here. Find time to take care of yourself in those times. That's the I want to I want to thank you Catherine. I I love what you're doing. I love your energy. I think you're the perfect person to help all the people that are out there that are struggling with this and that is is helping more of the care heroes like you call them. Thank you for coming on the show you're today. Welcome. Yeah, uh, we're going to close out the show now, everybody. Thank you for listening and tuning into the Cornelia Stephanie show. We'll see you again next week, everyone. Take good care. You've been listening to the Cornelia Stephanie show. Wake up to love your call to action. Tune in each week on Transformation Talk Radio. Cornelia's joy is to engage others in practical ways, showing us how to live in the new earth in harmony with our true nature. For more information on Cornelia and her extraordinary work, or to listen to past shows, go to her website at corneliastephanie.com.